Good day. God bless everyone. As I wait for a few people to come on, this is Kingdom Expectations Double Dip Tuesday Night Bible Study. I'm the senior pastor, Doc, a.k.a. Apostle Dr. Antonio E. Wright. So I'm here. I'm a little late. A little technical difficulties tonight. Some technical difficulties. From my, I, my notebook on my iPad, not wanting to open up my notes. So all of a sudden, my laptop had no charge. <laughs> but we are here as we get prepared to go into tonight's Bible study. So we'll give everybody a couple of moments to see that we're on. I think I should have it set up so we can say chat. Hey, top of the morning to you, Deacon Jerry. Grace and peace. How's your mom? Hey, Sister Tanya. Good evening, Minister Jackie. Good morning, Pamela. Hugs and kisses from my baby girl. What's up, baby girl? Trisha Wright, the prophet is in the house. Long live the king. No, no, stop. What's up, Huggy? Sister Tanya Pinson. T and T in the crib. Veronique, my snowbound Colorado sister. How are you doing? Ah, <laughs> uh, she got the snow. Y'all can keep it too, please. I sure appreciate it. All right, all right. 10 is a number of new beginnings. So we have 10 on. So there's no need in holding on. Let's say we get into this party and get it started. As always, let us pray. Father, we bless you. We glorify you. We magnify you. God, we thank you. As always, God, we thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you, Father, for a mind to serve you in spirit and in truth. We thank you that we're the head and not the tail, above only, not beneath. We thank you that we are uh, lenders and not the borrowers. We thank you for closing doors that no man can open and opening doors that no man can close. We thank you that we walk in divine health, wealth, and prosperity. Uh, we thank you for all of our needs being met. We thank you, God, for being our burden bearer. Uh, we thank you, God, that if we committed any sins, knowingly or unknowingly, that you forgive us of those sins as we repent. We then ask, God, that you give us a clean heart and mind that we might serve you in spirit and in truth. And as we prepare to go into the final of the Easter, the real story tonight, we ask that you bless us with revelation, knowledge, spiritual wisdom, and divine understanding of your word that this word will be imparted and implanted to the spirits of your sons and daughters. And as that word is imparted into their spirit, that the Holy Spirit might water that seed of that word, that it will reproduce unto you some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. 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 What's up, booby? Hey, Vanessa. Woo, here we go. So, I'm going to share a few things uh, getting ready tonight. Good morning, applesauce. This is the last part of um, Amen, Veronique. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, this is the last part of each of the real story. After that, we're going to go back in to finish up the book of Isaiah. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go ahead on and complete the Old Testament teaching. I'm going to do that. Hey, Cindy. I'm going to do that because periodically, uh, the truth of the matter is, most people who go to church don't know the Bible. They have no comprehension of the word of God other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not realizing that all the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as you found out in Isaiah, come from the Old Testament. So I'm going to complete the Old Testament. Uh, I don't know how long that's going to take. We should be out of that by next summer. But we're going to complete the Old Testament. And, and I want to parlay something else on you now. Periodically, times have changed. So periodically, you might hear me make reference to some ethnicities in the Bible. I make those references only because, case in point, when people lack identity, they don't understand purpose. And in order for you to understand purpose, you have to first of all know your identity. And one of the issues is, from a biblical point of view, it makes it seem as if there's no uh, people of color in the Bible. And that becomes an issue, especially if you're speaking to someone in the inner city. Uh, and it also becomes an issue with individuals because they don't think that they have an identity. They think they've just been written out. And so we have to understand uh, that there is multiple, you know, if we look at Israel itself, the truth be known, Israel is a mixed tribe of people because half of Jacob's sons come from his concubines who come from Egypt. And I'm sorry to tell you that Egypt is on the continent of Africa. 
and they just as dark as I am. The color changed, uh, the hue of their skin changed because of the tribes from the north as they infiltrated and they kept uh, making babies, for lack of a better statement, the lighter complexions came about. But trust me when I say, if you go back beyond the 15th uh, century, anything prior to that, you've seen pictures with different colors of skin. And as I told you before, when Michelangelo did the Sistine Chapel, that changed it all. It just wrote all of us out. So you'd be surprised at different ethnicities uh, uh, that are really in the Bible. Uh, I think there's a particular place where Solomon even said he was black. Uh, so it's just kind of strange. So you might hear me say that. So please don't take offense. My duty is to teach, and sometimes the truth will offend. It just happens that way. So I want to get into this tonight to finish up the, fin fin the, the final uh, uh, teachings on Easter, the real story. There is a possibility we'll do this every Easter. I don't know. I'll let you guys vote on it and tell me what you want to do. Uh, uh, yes, it is a beautiful uh, color of people all the way throughout, Veronique. That is a fact. So what I want to do is we finish this. If you got any, any questions or whatever, just pop it up. We do the best we can. So we see as we come to the end, some interesting stuff. Uh, Jesus spent 40 days on the earth that we know of after his resurrection, and he appeared to many people for those 40 days. Also be reminded of the fact that when the temple was rented to, it wasn't rented to like this, it was rented to like that. So it opened up. So all of those who had died in Abraham's bosom, in other words, all of those believers of God, of uh, Yeshua, uh, of, 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 of Jehovah Jireh and all of them, all of, still it's all the same God, but all of those believers of God uh, that had went on before when Abraham's bosom. And so when the temple was rented to and Jesus had already taken the keys of death, hell, and the grave, what happened was when the temple was rent, all of the dead in Abraham's bosom came alive. Well, they weren't dead. All of those who had went on before that that were in Abraham's bosom. You know, when they talked about the rich man and Lazarus in the Bible and how uh, Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham and there was a gulf between him and hell. And he looked at Abraham and uh, looked at Lazarus and asked Abraham if Lazarus could come and just touch his tongue with some water. And of course, Abraham said no. And he said, can Lazarus go back and tell my brothers? And Abraham said, you have the prophets. If they don't listen to the prophets, well, shame on them. Um, they were quarter to half black and I do. Hey, that's interesting, Veronique. I like that. That's good news. Uh, 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 so, so, so those people that were in Abraham's bosom, when the temple was rent, they also walked. So can you imagine your great, great uncle or your great, great, great grandfather walking and telling you about all the different things? Hello, Shana, that he witnessed and the people that was with him in Abraham's bosom. So along with Jesus, they also walked the earth for 40 days. Uh, so not only rose from the dead, but he appeared to people over and over with holes in his wrist and, and his feet and a puncture wound in his side. So nothing was hidden. Each of the gospel writers chooses, and that's the point I want to get through tonight. Each of the gospel writers choose a different way to end their gospel. Now, Matthew uh, chooses to end with what is now called the Great Commission. Then we have Mark and Luke both touch on Jesus's exit to heaven. Uh, to sit on the right hand of the throne of God. And then, of course, John does not tell us about Jesus' ascension at all. You know, John is the beloved. He's the one that's always been on Jesus' bosom, which is why, as I always uh, reiterate, those pictures that we see of the Lord, the Last Supper, of course, is wrong because they didn't eat at long tables like that. And number one, uh, number two, you don't see John on his bosom. And number three, they all look alike. But we do know from history References that those are Michelangelo's cousins, whole nother subject. Uh, so his purpose or John's purpose is to uh, describe certain details that the other gospel writers left out uh, with his personal discussion because John was personally involved with Christ as a friend. We read between Jesus and Peter there at the Sea of Galilee. So what I want to do, if you don't mind, is cover the endings of the other three accounts as we come to the close of this particular story which is why I had to make sure I found my notes. As we read in, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, King James Version. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they had saw him, or when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. That's Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Now, what happens is Jesus is now giving them a great commission to go out and make disciples, to spread the good news and pass on the teachings that Christ has forgiven them, right? For uh, uh, Christ has given them these particular teachings for three and a half years. Hey, Robert, how you be? So, so Christ is basically giving them the great commission. What I've taught you for three and a half years, I need you to go out now and teach that to others. Now, Matthew doesn't specifically describe Jesus' ascension, but it's clear, of course, to us that Christ is leaving because Matthew comforts us with Christ's words as he um, that he is always with us even until the end of the world. Mark. If we go into Mark, I need to slow down. Mark 16, verses 14 through 20. In Mark 16, 14 through 20, it says, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief. Upbraided mean he kind of like fussed at them. Upbraided with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Now that has nothing to do with them crazy folk in West Virginia to pick up snakes. He didn't say do that. Uh, it shall not hurt them. Um, so then after... The Lord had spoken unto them. He was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. See, again, you know, the word of God is confirmed with signs. And uh, I think we've had uh, uh, numerous signs in, the, in kingdom expectations of, of the Lord working on behalf of the word that the Lord has blessed us to share with others, which is remarkable to us. So if we look at this now, Mark is basically ends with a nice summary of Jesus's last words before it was taken up to heaven. So we see that Jesus tells them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And Mark finishes up his gospel by overviewing the many things the disciples did in the Lord's power as they went out to do just as Jesus has said. So whereas Matthew and Mark now, they finished with a summary, right? Luke gives us more detail about that final day that the disciples saw Jesus. Thank you, Nicole and Pamela. Yes, he does, doesn't he? Luke is not finished because he still has volume. Remember now, Luke isn't finished because he still has Acts. And again, I reiterate, and I'll probably go back in the New Testament after I finish the old, just because it's, new things are happening and we get more information. They call it the Acts of the Apostles, but the book of Acts is literally the Acts of Paul. And not only is it the Acts of Paul, it's actually a piece of paralegal paperwork that Luke got together to send before Paul when he was going to go and speak uh, 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 to the Roman emperor. And so this is like his letter to show that he wasn't the one that was inciting all these riots. It was the Judaizers, Judaizers that was coming against him because he had changed their doctrine. It's amazing how periodically what we call doctrine, when we change people's change thought process, they don't really like to follow that thought process. It's kind of like, when, when, I, when I start teaching against religion and start teaching the kingdom, I, I noticed I had some very few pastor friends that really supported me uh, because sometimes we get stuck in religion or we get stuck in our doctrines or we get stuck in the Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, the Catholic way. And Jesus didn't teach any of that. That's another subject. And so we have to be mindful of that's what the, the Pauline letter was for or the Acts of the Apostles, which is a paralegal piece of paperwork that Luke had wrote to go before Paul to let uh, the Roman emperor that he wanted to Caesar, to let Caesar know, I didn't start all these riots. These people started these riots because of the word of God. Anyway, move on, Rev. Don't mind if I do. Uh, so while Mark briefly described the works that the disciples did after Jesus ascended, Luke, the historian, is going to continue the narrative as we get into the book of Acts, going into detail and describing the acts of the apostles as they went into all the world. Of course, as you know, it is mostly... Um, Paul that we're, we're, we're talking about. Uh, so he ends his uh, gospel preparing to tell the continuation of the story. Now, if we look at Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 53, it reads like this. And he said unto them, these are the words which I speak unto you, 
while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tear ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as, Beth as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands, and he blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Bam. There we go. Uh, so basically, this ends what we call the Gospels. The next step, what would you have to do, which we're not going to do here, is pick up Luke's book of Acts and see what God did to his followers in the days and the particular decades that followed. Of course, uh, we've done the book of Acts, but we'll do all of that again after we come out of the Old Testament. So one of the things I want to do, you know, I'm always throwing curveballs uh, because I just like curveballs. Uh, and these are things historically that most people don't pay attention to. So I like to teach what I study. I like to teach what I learn uh, because every great teacher teaches himself out of a position. And these are things that are not commonly discussed, but there's reasons behind all of this. OK, so in Mark chapter 16, uh, before I close this out, Mark chapter 16. I want to uh, I want to give what I would call a defense. What's up, Deacon Gary? A, a defense to the last verses of Mark. So many Bibles today, you know, we got all these different translations. If you follow me in any period, if you follow, follow me in two weeks, I read out of several different translations, right? So what happens is uh, many Bibles today will footnote the last 12 verses of Mark and claim that those particular verses were added later. So I want to clarify that. They'll claim, so some of you guys have them study Bibles and then y'all are getting deep, which is good, but I need to give you reference because sometimes we get deep and we get swept. So I need to stop you from getting swept. I just need you to get deep. So they claim that the last 12 verses of Mark, right, were added later because of the differences in the available text. So because of that, they say the last 12 verses was added. So there are three codices of the New Testament. Now, a codis You'll hear me say that it's just an ancient manuscript. So there are three codices, uh, codices of the New Testament that date to the 4th and 5th centuries A.D. And because they are the oldest in our present possession, they are generally considered the closest to the original manuscripts of the New Testament. Generally, they're considered that. So we have the Codex of Alexandrinus, uh, that is a 5th century manuscript containing the entire New Testament brought to England in about 1630. And then we have the Codex of uh, C, Sinai, Sinai, Sinaiticus. Boy, I'll be messing that Greek up, don't I? Uh, <laughs> was discovered in St. Catherine's Monastery on the Sinai Peninsula and has been dated to about AD 350. Finally, we have the Codex Vaticanus, dated about 325, was held in the Vatican Library since at least 1481, but was not made available to scholars until the middle of the 19th century. The Vatican be holding some stuff, I'm telling y'all. Now, these three are generally lumped together as what they call the Alexandrian codices or the Alexandrian ancient manuscripts, if you would. Uh, but we find that certain passages in scripture do not appear in these three particular ancient manuscripts that everybody wants to use. There's an intense, a very intense ecclesiastical debate about this, and many scholars argue that the missing passages were simply later editions, right? But it's not later, it's not later editions. And, and I want I want y'all I want y'all to get to that. So from the sixth to the 14th centuries, the great majority of New Testament manuscripts was produced in Byzantine or Byzantine, Byzantinium, Byzant I always miss that Byzantine up too, uh, in Greek. It was in 1525 that Erasmus of Rotterdam, using five or six Byzantine manuscripts from the 10th to the 13th centuries compiled the first Greek text to be produced on a printing press, subsequently known as the Textus Receptus, which means received text. Now there's another curveball I can throw in here because what most people don't realize is they forgot to throw in the Aramaic language as well. Now when you throw in the Aramaic Bible, that's a whole nother baby. And we don't see many of them and I'm looking for one in particular. 
because one of my daughters posted something and I said, you know, that makes sense what I read. So a lot of times there's certain things that make sense on what I read that correlates with the Bible and we miss it, which is why I teach like I teach. So in a, in a, basically, so we, that particular one was the Textus Receptus, which means the received text. Now, the translators of the King James Version had over 5,000 manuscripts, right? They had over 5,000 manuscripts available to them, but they leaned most heavily on the major Byzantine manuscripts, particularly the Textus Receptus. Thus, we find, again, that the last 12 verses are marked in the King James, but not in the Alexandrian codices. So in other words, we find the 12 verses of Mark in the Textus Receptus. Now remember, the Textus, the Textus Receptus is the one uh, uh, that Erasmus of Rotterdam used the five Byzantine manuscripts to come out with the uh, this here, the, this truth that of the 12 verses in Mark. Uh, but not in the Alexandria codices, which was the, uh, the ancient manuscripts. For some reason, they weren't in there. But now there are certain reasons that we shouldn't trust the ancient manuscripts. There are certain reasons that we shouldn't trust in the ancient manuscripts uh, as far as the Alexandrian codices are, because they're not the best manuscripts. Now, here's why. First, they are replete with errors. In other words, they are filled with errors. Uh, manuscripts wear out when they are used frequently, right? But these particular three, the Alexandrian codices, did not wear out. They survived for centuries. Uh, they were not used. And one of the reasons they were not used is because they have a lot of errors in there. <laughs> so that becomes suspect because nobody's going to use the manuscripts if they're full of errors, which means they're not going to be worn out like the right manuscripts are. If we look at the Byzantine documents, the date to later centuries, but we have thousands of manuscripts that can be compared to each other for differences. And the Byzantine documents were copies of earlier, older documents that were trusted and used. This is going to get good in a minute. So among the disputed passages, I love this, is the textual co controversy of the final verses. And that's uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Let's have some fun. Uh, this is my point of sharing this. If we look at this, if we look at this, uh, uh, there were in this document. In if we look at the doc in this documentary, documentary evidence that these verses was actually deleted. Let me get my notes right. Thus, there is documentary evidence that these verses were actually deleted from the Alexandrian text. However, because it seems that Irenaeus and Hippolytus both quoted from these disputed verses, clear back in the second century. Now, if we read the text, right, it actually doesn't make sense to delete the final verses of Mark. Now, here's the reason why. Here's my argument. It makes no sense to delete these final verses of Mark because without them, the gospel stops abruptly with this particular statement. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. And that's it. It would just stop right there. Now, that doesn't sound right. So, you know, you, the other one, so it makes no sense in the book um, about Jesus with a line about fearful women. Uh, so the disputed verses are necessary literally to finalize the story. But I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a little curveball. You know, I, I love curveballs. So if you recall, when we studied the book of Psalms, there's this thing called the heptatic structure. Uh, the heptatic structure is when some Psalms have groups of seven or sevenfold. So what happens is if we examine the last seven verses, if we examine the last seven verses or the final 12 verses, rather, say I'm stuck on seven now. If we examine the final 12 verses closely enough, we find something that is very interesting in those last 12 verses in Mark. What we actually see is God's fingerprints all over them in the form of passages that form heptatic structure. Of course, that's seven or sevenfold structures. And now, you know, seven means completion. Now, I need you to get ready. Hold tight, cut the other TV off, tell the kids to quit talking, hurry up and go to the bathroom, wash your hands, sit down, because we get ready to take a ride for about 10 minutes before we finish the rest of this. Check this out. A simple reading of the Bible gives us a sense that the number seven is important, as I just related to. There are over 600 explicit occurrences of sevens throughout both the Old and New Testament. 
Now, as many of us know, many of y'all have followed our teaching, many of y'all members of the church know, as many of you know, uh, are aware of, there are also prevalent evidences of design hidden behind the text. Here's one of those situations. So we have the heptatic or the sevenfold structure of biblical text is one of the remarkable characteristics of its authenticity. So here's how we authenticate the last 12 verses of Mark. Thank you. Look at this. So we're going to look at these 12 verses. I'm going to share with you what I found. Just a little history. I'm going to share with you what I found. It turns out, I got to breathe, man, because this is going to be this is going to be a roller coaster. It turns out that there are 175 words in the Greek text of Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. You say, well, Doc, what, why 75 words? 75 words is seven times, 175 words is seven times 25. Is that seven? Kind of curious, right? These words use a total vocabulary of 98 different words. That's seven times 14. That's also another exact multiple of seven. That's kind of striking, right? I'm not finished yet. The number of letters in this passage is 553. That's seven times 79. In fact, the number of vowels is 294. That's seven times 42. And the number of consonants is 259. That's seven times 37. Look, if we examine the vocabulary of 98 unique words, that's 84, that's seven times 12. Look, 84 of them are found early in Mark and 14, that's seven times two, is only found right here. Do you see what I'm trying to tell you? All this stuff is hidden in the scripture. I love teaching. With just seven such heptatic features, it would take seven times seven or seven to the seventh power or 823, 554 attempts for these to occur by chance alone. It's impossible for it to be done to occur by chance alone, except the hand of God be on those last 12 verses. Look, an author that's actually working eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, making one attempt every 10 minutes could take more than 68 years to randomly create these patterns that I just shared with you. And I still have not given you all of them. Nope, sure haven't. Here's a couple more. The total word forms in the passages are 133, that's seven times 19. A full 112 of them, seven times 16, occur only once, leaving 21, seven times three of them, occurring more than once. In fact, these occur 63 times, which is seven times nine. This is crazy, y'all. If we examine more closely, <laughs> That's right, Nicole, the completion all over the place. If we examine more closely the 175 total words, we discover that 56, that's seven times eight, words appear in the address of the Lord and 119, seven times 17, appear in the rest of the passages. Amen, somebody. There is a heptatic structure within the natural divisions of the passage. The divisions are Christ's appearance to Mary, verses nine through 11, his subsequent appearances, verses 12 through 14, and Christ's discourse, verses 15 through 18, and the conclusion in verses 19 through 20. We discover that in verses 9 through 11, it involves 35 words, that's 7 times 5, and verses 12 through 18, right, <laughs> involves 105 words, that's 7 times 15. In fact, verse 12 has 14 words, that's 7 times 2. Verses 13 through 15 have 35 words, that's 7 times 5. And verses 16 through 18 have 56 words, that's seven times eight. The conclusion, verses 19 to 20, contains 35 words, that's seven times five. So we see here, I'm just, <laughs> you see here, when people say that verses 12, the last 12 verses of Mark was added, it's impossible for somebody to just add this. It had to have been there from the beginning, which is why we have it in there. That's just that theological fight that we have. So I always have something to throw at people. So now we see even finer detail in the Greek, and the Greek it gets even better. Check this out. Greek like Hebrew has been assigned, remember, numerical values. The Greek like Hebrew has numeric. So each Hebrew letter has a numerical value. Well, each Greek letter has a numerical value as well in the alphabet. Each word has what we call a geometrical value. So the total numerical value of the passage is 103,656. What does that mean? That's seven times 14,808. The value of verse nine is 11,795. That's 7,000, 
seven times 1,685. Now, for me, this is crazy because you got sevens all any way you look at it, Hebrew, Greek, whatever, seven is in this joint. Versus 10, the number value. So basically what I'm saying is each letter has a number value. So each letter in verse nine comes out to a value of 11,795. We get that by multiplying seven times 1685. You don't just get that randomly. If we look at verse 10 in the Greek, the numeric geometrical value of each letter combined in verse 10 is 5,418. That is literally seven times 774. Verse 11, the, the, the numerical, value, numerical value of each letter is 11,795. That's seven times 1685 and so forth. Now I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna pause, because most people say, well, why, man, what is all this relevant to? What is relevant to is how, how, how awesome the word of God is and how intent and how intense God wants you to see his hand on every word that is spoken. He wants you to see his hand on every letter. There is nowhere in the world, as I as I share with you, there's nowhere in the world an author can sit down and figure this out. It take too long, he'd be dead. He'd be still scribbling. But here we have the hand of God. So in other words, this book that most people just, oh, that's just a book written by man. It's written by men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit and a God who was outside our time continuum because there's no way in the world you can sit naturally and do all this in such short period. Of it's just, it can't be done. So look, basically, yeah. So my point is, as I get out of this, the 75 heptatic features of the last 12 verses of Mark, it literally encourages me, encourages me. I hope it encourages you. It encourages me that we should ignore the faulty Alexandrian codices and give Mark credit for offering a summary at the end of the gospel. Simple as that. Uh, and that's in case some of y'all might run into some of these so-called theologians that want to want to try to challenge you. I, and you know, I, I said this with the church, and one of these days I'm gonna do this. I shared this with the church a couple of months ago. Why you? Go, I don't even know why you go to Bible college. Just sit down and just come to Bible study. Let me teach. Because what I'm gonna teach you, the colleges ain't gonna teach you this. They don't. They don't want you to know this. They want you to still stay dumb. That's another subject. So. What is yet to come, so I can get on out of here and let you guys go home. I got a couple more minutes. I got to hurry up. What is yet to come is this. So I'm going to read kind of fast. I got 20 minutes. What, what is yet to come is this. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ changed the world. It literally changed hell to Kathy. It literally changed eternity. 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus ascended into heaven. And 10 days after the Holy Spirit alighted on the disciples on the day of Pentecost. In one day, in one day, those men went from quiet fishermen and former zealots and tax collectors to evangelists. God damn you like that. To evangelists crying out to everybody that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. One day they were a terrified mess about the, they were terrified about the mess they were in, hiding away behind locked doors. Remember, weeks later, they're willing to be tortured to death, willing to die for the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What, what, what you think? What you think? What you think? Peter went from denying Christ before a servant girl uh, to telling all of Jerusalem that Jesus had risen. The works that Jesus did, the disciples multiplied as they went out preaching the gospel and healing. People hoped just to have Peter's shadow fall on the sick because they said even his shadow, I got emotional then, even his shadow would heal the sick. So they would, you know, it's like people was running. Can you imagine that? People was running in the street just to get up under Peter's shadow because as he walked, his shadow would heal the sick. And that's what God desires for us today. Here's what Luke tells us in Acts chapter, Acts chapter five, verses 12 through 16. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest, there's no man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women in so much that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on the beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities, round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folk and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. What am I trying to tell you? If we get out of trying to make sure that we have everything we need and start seeking after God to make sure he gets everything he needs, He'll make sure that not only there's signs of wonders following, but he'll make sure that our needs are met. 
But sometimes we get caught up wanting to make sure that the house is done, the cars is done, the clothes is done, uh, the business is done, the job is done, and all our desires is done. We forget about God's desire is to use us for his glory so that signs and wonders can follow. Can you imagine if you went to your office and your shadow started healing people? Can you imagine how many folks going to want to get on the elevator with you? Can you imagine how awesome, how awesome the hand of God desires to be on your life? But we do get caught up wanting to do our own thing, our own way, because we think we know everything that's going on and we don't always want to listen to the shepherd. It's so amazing to me how we miss the gospel of Jesus Christ because we get a little educated and we think we got it going on. Somebody let me say, shut up, I'm going to get out of here. So look, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. <laughs> So the evidence points to this. Hundreds of people saw him after his death and his disciples canvassed the known world to tell of what they themselves had seen. They didn't get anything out of it, no money or fame, no worldly honor. Think about it, they didn't get, they didn't get no honor. They went hungry, they were thirsty, been there. They faced all kinds of opposition, still there. But they kept at it because it was the truth. It was the truth and the Holy Spirit led them, giving them the power that Jesus had. What was the power that Jesus had to heal, to free, and to cleanse? Look, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, 6 p.m. Saturday night, which was their Sunday after Passover, on the Feast of First Fruits. And Jesus today serves as the first fruits of those who will be made brand new in him. He was the first to conquer death and walk in newness of life. He was the forefronter, and his desire was for the rest of us to follow him. Through his resurrection power, all those who look to him will be saved, and we too can walk in his new life. First Corinthians 15, Paul explains the power and importance, excuse me, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he explains in detail the life we have because Jesus conquered death and broke the curse that has plagued us since Adam. First Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 26. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man also, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. When Jesus Christ returns, we will all, we will all receive the new bodies he's prepared for us. So of course, remember now, this body we're in right now, yeah, this is just hardware. This is just our hardware. The main thing that lasts is our software. I got computer on this. It's not the real us. The real us is the software, and we're always going to be headed for an upgrade. Jesus will subject all things to himself, and he will ultimately destroy death together. Remember what he told his disciples in the upper room in uh, St. John chapter 16, verse 33. He comforted them by saying, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Jesus has already overcome, and through him we have the trustworthy promise of victory. These broken, dying, sick bodies are not what we would consider our final bodies and uh, just the bowls for our spirits. That's all. You know, we're trying to lose this weight. We ain't trying to be unhealthy either, but I'm just trying to tell you, this ain't my final body. Software is our spirit, man. It has no mass. It's eternal. Uh, we are eternal beings, and just like a little seed sprouts from the ground to become a gorgeous blossom, so these failing bodies that we're in will arise as something more beautiful and glorious than anything we can imagine. Here's what Paul tells us as I try to get out of here. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 54. Behold, I show you a mystery. We should not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Also, we look at the pain and suffering that constantly surrounds us, discouraged, uh, heartbroken, weak and weary. We can take comfort and have the knowledge of the fact that there is a man on the throne of God. That's Jesus. And he is faithful. And not only is he faithful, he's true. And he is literally preparing an eternal home as we speak. Jesus rose again 
from the dead. So in that fact, he has the victory and he continues to rescue us from death of our lives and the lives of those around us every day. If he tarries, right? If he tarries, each one of us will be planted in the ground, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, but we are destined for a resurrection that will last forever. Excuse me, please. <sighs> Sorry about that. Hopefully I ain't got nothing hanging on it. <laughs> I want to share with you the story of a little girl. Share with you a story of a little girl. Share with you a piece of, might not be a testimony, just something I want to share. And then we're going to let y'all go. Amen. I, I pray that you've been blessed tonight. Yeah, I'm excited. So there's a little girl whose mother had a horribly disfigured face. And when she was small and going to school, the children would make fun of her because of her mother's face. Now, she often came home from school crying because the kids teased her so cruelly. Uh, was that the last trouble? Vanessa, you crazy. <laughs> Oh, God, you stupid. You stupid. <laughs> was that the last? Girl, you was insane. No, that's not the last one. <laughs> Where was I at? Look, so she often came from home. She often came home from school crying because the kids had teased her so cruelly, right? So when the little girl became old enough, the mother explained to her what... When the little girl got old enough, the, what, the mother explained to her when she was a baby that there was a dreadful fire in the apartment. And the mother was able to save the little girl, but she sustained serious burns in doing so, which is why her face was so disfigured. So from that day on, the little girl was no longer embarrassed by her mother. In fact, every time she looked at her face, this is a tearjerker, every time she looked at her face, she knew how much she was loved because her mother risked her life to save her. Is it possible that Jesus today still has the nail prints in his hand and, this, and the hole in his side because he loved us just that much. Uh, the scars of his humiliation will be also the marks of his glory, uh, the fact of his incredible sacrifice of love on our behalf. Every time we look into his face, we'll realize how much we are loved. God bless your losses. Look, here's what we do know. We know that when we do see his face, we'll be able to see him as he is because we will be like him. Whatever dimension he has, a dimensionality he has, whatever his form, we'll be able to understand him because he will have made us to be as he is, made in his image once again. Here's what Apostle uh, uh, John tells us in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You know, the more, the more I'm in the word, the more I learn, the more I, I, I come to understand. Um, I understand more fully, and I've shared this before. I think about when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and actually understanding about yoke. When Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, that basically means that the believers of that day, and I'm gonna use John the Baptist for instance, and I'll tell you why. When someone was yoked with someone, they took on the character of that priest. There was a priest or a shepherd they wanted to be like. They wanted the mantle, the anointing, the revelation, the knowledge, the wisdom. So they yoked together with that priest. Whatever that priest said, they said. Wherever that priest went, they went. Now I know today people don't understand that, but whatever Dr. Rick says, I say. Wherever Dr. Rick goes, I go. I don't go against Dr. Rick. Whatever he says, I study it, I receive it. I'm not going to go against Dr. Rick because I'm yoked with him. God, I love that. So I, I, I 
and I periodically I say this, if, if, if passion is not so much as the easiest thing, but I love what I do. But I, 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 can you imagine if my wife and I, if 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 there was ten of us that believe like we believe, that move like we move, that comprehend like we comprehend, and would say what we say and do as we do, as you've seen the signs and wonders in our lives, can you imagine the signs and wonders in your life? I see now what it meant when they 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 when 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 some of the disciples says. I've not heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit because I was baptized in John's baptism. So in other words, whenever they were yoked with those particular priests, they also were baptized by that priest. So when they got baptized in the river by John, they were not just getting baptized to repent of their sins, to change their mind, but they were also being baptized to be yoked with John, to believe in John, to follow John, to support John. And Whatever John did, they did, which is why in the book of Acts, when they said, we've not heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit because we have John's baptism. They were yoked with John. And Jesus is saying even today, if, if, if you yoke with your shepherds that you trust, if you yoke with your leaders, if you yoke with them as we yoke in my word, can you imagine the miracles that you can do? If you yoke with the truth and not your opinion, can you imagine the impact and the influence that you can have in society? Can you imagine the lives you can touch and the minds that you can change? Can you, man can you imagine the manifestations of healings that can come forth? Can you really? I can't, we can't hear you. I was saying, when you think about it, when you take on the mind of Christ, you're no longer thinking how you can do it, but you want to do what pleases him, how he can be glorified through it. Um, it's not about you. you. You have no show in this. It's about you yielding yourself and allowing him to show up because we don't know what to do. But when you're in your flesh, you try to uh, put on a show. But this ain't about a show. This is about God being glorified in him, being, you know, lifted up from the earth. Come on, man. It's time out for us, you know, playing this game like we got it going on all the time. We ain't got it going on. It's by his grace and mercy we got it. That's so, it. you know, let, let that flesh go. Follow, follow. If you know a man or a woman that's truly speaking the word of God and is bearing witness in your spirit, man, follow that. Yeah. You know, but if you see somebody putting on a show for you, don't follow that. That's a deceiving spirit. But your 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 spirit man will bear witness when it's the truth of God's word. Yeah. And you gotta remember everything is accountable. Yeah. Unless you that's it. Amen. <laughs> Amen, babe. Amen. I'm sorry, y'all. It's just one of them things. One day. One day. So look, one day, amen. Never said it'd be easy, but you gotta be willing to suffer. No, nope, never said it'd be easy, show sure easy. Child, let me tell y'all, I'd be in the truck today. Woo -woo. So God is good. Yeah. We're all his God is good, yes. God is good, God is good. So you got uh Nicole said amen, mom. Pam said yes, mom. Uh Veronique is off the corner. I gotta see an honorable hunger. Amen, Veronique. God is good, y'all. That's all I can say. So next week I finish up with Isaiah. Uh I'm still excited. I'm gonna stay excited. Uh whether I'm yoked with anybody or not, I'm gonna still stay excited. It's eventually they coming. I'm going to still stay excited. I'm going to keep building. I'm going to keep building. And eventually, they're going to understand it's not a game. It's life. And it's his life. For Christ I live and Christ I die. And that's no excuse nor an alibi. It's just the way we roll, baby. So, look, man, I appreciate you guys. I'm going to get off here before I keep talking. Before I keep. Before I keep. I want to say this. For the people, I don't know who it's for, but 
whoever this is for, be encouraged and don't give up. Because when you're going through, God is doing something in you. And you can be stripping something off of you. The trial is not to cause you to be discouraged. But the trial is to cause you to be encouraged. Because when you go through, you're going to see the manifestation of the glory of God like never before. But the enemy wants us all to give up. But I say this to whoever it might be for, don't give up and don't give in. But hang in there because God is doing something in you. Amen. Did, did, well, I know it's going to be about 30 seconds. I'm going to wait to see if y'all heard what mom said, baby girl said, prophetess said, Dr. Wright said. How many titles you got? Just, just <laughs> mom. Oh. <laughs> you going to see the glory, and then you're going to have a story. Yes. Amen. Amen. Amen, Nikki. Part of our identification. Hey, Stephanie. What's up, girl? I didn't know you was in there. Hey, Pastor Seward, I think I seen you a minute ago. Look, man, we love you guys. Uh, some of you guys well, I'll see tomorrow morning. Some of you will be on replay uh, for Tea Time Devotional, 7.45. 50 in the morning. Uh, some of you catch that on replay, but I appreciate those that will be up in the morning with me to watch to do that, that live devotional at 730. And uh, thank you guys that are on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter that are following us. As I said, if all goes well uh, financially, we'll be doing uh, live also on our webpage at uh, the end of the month. End of the month, June, is what we're shooting for. Uh, <laughs> Stephanie said, faith it till you make it. <laughs> That's a good one. Faith it till you make it. Because I had to reread that. You know my glasses, they progressive lens, girl. They don't work. Uh, but look, man, we love you guys. You know we do. We appreciate all of you. I ain't going to start calling names because I miss some of you. But everybody that's on here, everybody that's uh, sharing it on their page, everybody that's watching this on YouTube or Twitter, know this for sure, that we love you. And in the doggone thing, you can do it by <laughs> So as always, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine and he will be gracious on you. The Lord lift up his conscience upon you and grant you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. And you know me, this is the doc, and I'm out. Peace, shalom, grace. Later. Nikki Taylor, <laughs> love you, girl.